Mr. Ambassador, Honorary Chairman, Dean, everybody. I must humbly admit that it uh, feels good to be honored. <laughs> I'm also happy as the day is long that we can devote the whole day on the welfare state at the Hurtis School. And I thank the Dean and the Hurtis School for organizing this event. And I thank all invited speakers, uh, discussants, moderators, and participants to to, for coming and for sharing their thoughts on the topic of varieties of welfare states. Ideally, we should cover varieties in the entire world, but that would have been too ambitious. Uh, I'm very glad that we can have an European-Asian uh, perspective today. Uh, the symposium should inspire comparisons of welfare state experiences and prospects within and between the regions where the welfare state historically was born and where the most spectacular economic development has taken place in recent decades. European governments did not look to Asia towards the end of the 19th century when social insurance and a new social active role of the state emerged as a widely seen proper political response to social problems created by capitalist and industrial development. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Today, East Asian and other nations looked, look with mixed assessments to varieties of European welfare state experiences and are, for a number of reasons, unlikely to fully embrace any of the European models. And as we know, these so-called models are themselves undergoing continuous modifications. On the other hand, it's probably worthwhile and of great political self-interest for European governments today to look towards Asia, to observe and analyze what kind of welfare states currently develop or are likely to develop, especially in China and other large East Southeast Asian nations. In a more interdependent, competitive global economy, it matters more for a nation what policies and what type of welfare states institution building other nations pursue. This symposium could easily also have directed attention towards other regions, in particular Latin America, where significant social policy innovations have come about during the last 20 years. But today's program concentrates on the two regions with which I have most personal experience in my own research and teaching. I have been lucky and privileged to have been given the opportunity to join the Hertie School of Governance almost from the beginning to do research in the context of an international faculty and teach and interact with and learn from very international classes of students. I have taught and supervised students of all MPP classes since the first class of students were admitted in 2005. The title of the symposium is playing on the famous Varieties of Capitalism book and should convey the message that the the study of welfare state constructions and experiences are equally important for understanding how modern societies fare and change politically, economically, and socially. There are many roads to welfare and well-being. With the experience of the recent global financial crisis and the relative economic success of northern European countries, not only Scandinavia, also Germany, and I will definitely count in, it seems that the third way or the middle way, as the American journalist Childs characterized Sweden in 1936, this road seems to be getting to get, become more congested, the third way. But more research on varieties of welfare state constructions and varieties of welfare governance is needed. We need more knowledge and understanding of what political history, cultural context, international settings, and timing mean for directions of welfare state development. We need a better understanding of reasons for or normative foundations for policy choices and their implications for well-being, social justice, equality, income distribution and poverty. We need a better understanding of the role of welfare institutions for building and consolidating social capital and trust. We need a better understanding of relationship between demographic change, migration, and economic and political sustainability of welfare states. And we need to know more about relationships be between welfare state constructions and political legitimacy and government ability 
to manage unforeseen economic crisis in a more globalized world. And I think maybe this is the last point. It's something we might learn a little bit more about later today when we look at the Nordic model. Let me say a few words about how, how I came to take an interest in comparative politics, and more specifically, the topic of welfare state development and varieties of welfare states. It is, as many things in life, a result of uh, good timing and luck. It was sheer lucky timing that I finished high school in the same year as Stein Rocken was appointed professor of sociology with a special obligation to develop comparative politics at the University of Bergen in 1966. Rockan became the great social science entrepreneur at the Young University in Bergen. It was established in 1946 at the second Norwegian University. Given his appointment, there was absolutely no academic need to move to Oslo for political science studies, which until then offered the only political science uh, uh, teaching in, in Norway, and that also developed as a discipline after the Second World War in Norway. I was privileged to be among Rockan's first class of students, only 13 students, and thus I got a flying start from day one at the university. Five of us ended up as professors, and three of us are still at the Department of Comparative Politics in Bergen. I don't know how familiar you are with Rockan as a personal scholar. Most of you are too young to have met him. He died in 1979. But we, as young students in the late 1960s, soon learned that Rockan was a star in the international network of scholars in comparative political sociology, and we benefited greatly from being close to a star. He was definitely one of the leading entrepreneurs in the world of international social science cooperations in the 1960s and 70s, among others in the International Political Science Association, where he was president for three years, uh, in the uh, International Sociological Association, where he was vice president for four years, in UNESCO's International Social Science Council, which he initiated and also chaired for many years, and the, in the ECPR, European Consortium for Political Research, of which he was one of the eight founding fathers, and as you said, there were not many mothers around at that time, one of the eight founding fathers and its first chairperson from 1970 to 1976. Thanks to him, I became co-responsible for a quarterly European political data newsletter, and I also edited that newsletter for 10 years after his death. So I was very lucky to be part of the early build-up of ECPR, and that brought me to many uh, networks with old and old stars in political science in Europe, and also the younger uh, generation coming up. So in, uh, I participated in the first ECPR joint session of workshop, which was an innovation itself to organize uh, scientific activity in that way. That was in Mannheim in 1973, and in the report from the ECPR from that first workshop, um, I and my young student colleagues were, were referred to as Rockan's boys. So that something, says something about our, the importance of Rockan for us. It was also thanks to Rockan that I, as a young student, met Peter Flora, who should have been here today. Unfortunately, he couldn't come. He was sick. We met at an international conference in Lausanne in 1971, my very first experience as participant in an international conference. And, he, and his comparative study, jointly with Wolfgang Zapf, of time series analysis in research on modernization in Western Europe, inspired my later post-degree research into the comparative origins of Nordic welfare state development and later comparative welfare state development in general. Subsequent cooperation and not least participation in Peter's comparative project on the growth to limits, we turned the old title limits to growth on his head, looking at the West European welfare state after 1945. This participation led to lasting networks of welfare state researchers of tremendous importance and inspiration for my own work. I'm also glad to see that many of today's speakers, moderators, moderators moderators and discussants are well-known names on the reading list for my courses of so on social policy at the Hurtis School. The study of the welfare state has moved a long way 
from preoccupation with Western, in particular European welfare states, at the beginning of my academic career, 40 years ago, to the comparative study of welfare state development in all continents and regions of the world today. Also, concepts like global social policy and global social protection floor have entered our terminology and added new perspectives in a field of study, which very much was, and still is, building on the nation state as a unit of analysis and comparison. I started out in the early 1970s with a simplistic view on the welfare state as a successful crowning of national, social, and political mobilization, signifying the last phase of state and nation building processes. But if the welfare state was broadly considered a political success, it did not take long before its sustainability was questioned. The first oil crisis and the first book on the crisis of the welfare state came in 1973 when James O'Connor published The Fiscal Crisis of the State. Since then, a steady stream of critical, pessimistic studies of the welfare states have appeared. And as you will see, uh, that's a long, this is just a snapshot of book titles on the welfare state. There's a big industry of welfare state studies now. And most of them have elements of crisis in the title with one exception, but it hasn't, it hasn't helped much, <laughs> that I tried to provide another perspective uh, uh, through this edited volume. And I didn't put a question mark in 12 years ago. Maybe today, I'm uh, not quite sure. So, and we have not, or hardly ever, taken time to celebrate the post-World War II achievements of the welfare state, although I'm sure we cannot imagine what Europe would have looked like today without the expansion of national welfare states after 1945. But there will be changes ahead, and I think some other speakers today will point to some of these challenges we are heading. It's a little bit difficult talking from a Norwegian perspective, because Norway is such an exception in, the, in Europe and the world today. But uh, we will learn more about both Europe and, and East Asia later. My long-term and bird's-eye view uh, or perspective on welfare state development has in general been more positive and optimistic than that of most of my colleagues at home and abroad. And I guess that helps explain why the South Korean Minister of Social Affairs at the end of an international conference in Seoul 12 years ago addressed me as Mr. Welfare State. So as Mr. Welfare State, I have lectured mostly on the bright side of welfare state development in more than 30 countries and in close to 100 universities and research institutions and ministries. The comparative study of social policies and welfare states have become global. Although the welfare state concepts is not used everywhere and not always used with a positive connotation, just look to the US. But the globalization of ideas and institutions of state welfare of some kind or another seem to become as important as economic and political globalization. While some scholars predict, the econom predict that economic globalization will lead to a race to the bottom of welfare states, I've tended to make the opposite observation, that the welfare state in one form or another is globalizing. While for a long time it has been considered the fact that nations develop welfare states because they are rich, one might turn this around and say, with an eye to Northern Europe today, or over the last 30 years, that it's just as likely that nations get and stay rich because they have developed welfare states. I would argue that with economic globalization, the social and political importance of developing and maintaining national welfare states increases. Perhaps we can argue that welfare states are examples of global public good, in the meaning that the existence of developed national welfare states with the universal education, social security, and health systems makes for less social inequality, more social stability, and less risks of epidemics both within, within and beyond nation states. National welfare states create positive externalities in a world of increasing cross-national and cross-continental mobility. Anti-poverty policies and investment in universal public health care systems are beneficial beyond national borders. The welfare state has public good qualities, just as, for example, financial stability, efficient market, markets, clean environment, peace and security. 
This perspective also implies that the international cooperation and coordinated policy making on broadly defined social health and welfare policies may be increasingly likely and politically necessary in order to develop and consolidate national welfare states and strengthen their character of global public goods. With this brief introductory remarks, I think I prepared the ground for the keynote speech by Bjorn Persson on the welfare state goes global, lessons learned from the Nordic model. Uh, Dean Anaya already made some introduction on before you, just before you came, so we know you have been prime minister for 10 years, the last social democratic prime minister so far in Sweden. And you've also been Minister of Finance at a critical time in the 1990s in Sweden and also Minister of Schools in Sweden. And Jörn Persson was also President of the European Council when Sweden had the EU presidency in 2001. So I give the floor to Jörn Persson, please. <laughs> 